Hello, welcome back to Movie Husbands. Today we'll be reviewing Between the Temples. A cantor in a crisis of faith finds his world turned upside down when his grade school music teacher re-enters his life as his new adult bat mitzvah student. The film is directed by Nathan Silver and stars Carol Kane, Jason Schwartzman, Dolly De Leon, and many, many more. So Matt, what'd you think of Between the Temples? All right, so as you just mentioned, this film stars Jason Schwartzman and Carol Kane, and Schwartzman has had a long working relationship with Wes Anderson, if you didn't know, and most recently played the lead in Asteroid City. And as for Carol Kane, someone who has had a very long career in television and film, I personally remember her most recently from Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, where she played one of my favorite characters, Lillian, in that show. I do mention these two specific performances, like Asteroid City and Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, for a particular reason, which I'll get into. But in this film, we have them playing the characters of Ben and Carla, respectively. And as you mentioned a little bit, they strike this unusual friendship when Carla asks Ben to help her embrace her Jewish identity and study to have her own bat mitzvah, even though she is a bit older in age at this point. Ben, on the other hand, is is very clearly depressed from the loss of his wife. At one point in the film, in the beginning, this gives you a sense of his character in this particular point, but he lies in the middle of the road and when a truck comes, it stops because it sees him and he just, it's really humorously done, but also kind of sad. He, you know, waves it to just, just keep going, just keep going. Yeah. Big fan of that scene, by the Big way. Big fan, I knew you would be. <laughs> and so Carla, on the other hand, she is much more outgoing and personal. We first find her at the bar where he ends up after this incident with the truck, but she she's loud, she's outgoing she she's easy to make friends and she quickly converses with him and that's when they find out about their connection in the past and thus the film progresses from there but you know it's this dry cynical humor that he has which is very like his role in asteroid city i found compared to her blunt and like loud humor which is something that was very specific to her character in kimmy schmidt i thought that these two different types of comedic personalities really lended itself well to each other and made this a really good dynamic duo in the film now one of my immediate thoughts upon leaving the theater was wow this film is a bit of a cluster I thought that the camera movement was weird at times with these very quick zooms you would see in an episode of The Office. The editing is choppy with junk cuts, creating this visual inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. The dialogue is very scattered at times, often with actors speaking on top of each other. And while these things might seem like negatives, they are actually the very reasons I found myself enjoying the film so much. I think Nathan Silver did a wonderful job here creating a very unusual, purposely messy film that also successfully manages to humorously and endearingly reflect on religious identity, loss, and personal growth. I said to you as uh, we were walking out of the theater that if I described this movie to you with a grieving main character and another character who's lost their faith and they intersect and they have this friendship that's mutually beneficial, that perhaps they can move forward with their lives, you probably wouldn't picture this movie, which is like painfully awkward and cringy. What I described does happen, but it happens more in the subtext. But the movie seems a lot more interested in the extremely awkward and detailed scenes of like strange human behavior, yeah. which which I really liked. I thought that was an effective way to to tell this story and frankly the movie i just described is a movie i've seen a hundred times but i haven't exactly seen a movie like this before i think i should start with the humor because really the film is very funny it's an endurance test in some ways for cringe humor but it's never less than very funny i think all the way through the humor is really in the details like these strange or awkward situations i'm reminded of the scene early on between the rabbi and carla where their cars are face to face and they're both in their cars screaming at each other <laughs> trying to have this conversation with Ben and it's cut so oddly and when you they're, say screaming at each other it's not that they are actually screaming at each other in a, a menacing way from a car yes. so that they can actually hear them they're having a regular conversation but yeah. just to elevate their voices and that's a good point because in, there's a later scene too in a restaurant where that has these like comically gigantic menus that breaks the tension of a really intense conversation that they're having anyway that's just an example or two how the film inserts these little details to complicate a scene and really juggle this slapstick quality with the film's drama that I really liked. I completely agree. And on that note, I want to talk a little bit of the dialogue because I call that very messy. But at the same time, it's very purposefully done in this film. And it lends itself a lot to the humor as you were talking about. In a normal film, if two people are in a busy room and they're the important actors in a scene and they're talking to each other, it's elevated for their voices. Yeah. But the natural voices in the room are actually lowered. So that way you could hear the conversation of your two main characters. But this movie completely ignores those conventional filmmaking ideas to just have all this audio from anywhere in the room just on top of each other. It's funny, but it's also, I think, more realistic to what you would experience 
in a gathering rather than what you do see in a lot of other films. And dreadfully discomforting. There's a scene where they're eating hamburgers and you can hear like the swishing and the chewing. Every dinner scene, the wine is being poured so loudly, yeah. constantly. It's so grating and, and really effective. Another aspect of the humor that I really enjoyed are these character observations in a way that almost reminded me of Curb Your Enthusiasm. And that mm. goes beyond just the cringiness. For instance, there's a running joke about the rabbi being a really bad golfer. There are scenes set in his office where Ben is trying to have a heart to heart with him, but he only interested in working on his putt game. Yeah, yeah. He's putting his um his his ball into like an animal horn that he's like, don't worry, it's kosher. <laughs> and later in the film, Ben is his caddy and he's clearly cheating where he lays the ball yeah, to yeah. take a swing. And the swing he takes is really terrible. But it's it's funny stuff. That's just one example. But there are many characters in this film that have these really funny attributes. Also, there's a very, very quick shot where he, Ben enters the room and the rabbi quickly closes off his phone. But you hear the word golf in the video it's so quick <laughs> but it, it really added to that as yeah well. it's a deceptively funny film it's edited in a way that it's embarrassed how funny it is like you could miss so much of the humor here and other thing you were talking about was other instances of running gags in the movie and one of those is Ben's parents mm -hmm. who are consistently trying to set him up with a new woman usually that entails them inviting somebody over their house and them just happening to be there you know quote unquote when Ben comes home yeah, because they really are just planning this and it's like oh blah 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 here he is and then they get into these awkward conversations because it's just right on the spot. This is the opening scene of the movie so I, I don't think this could be considered a spoiler but they say to him we really think you should see a doctor and we mm. have the impression that this is like you should go see a therapist but there's actually a doctor a plastic surgeon waiting outside that they want him to date like <laughs> really funny <laughs> another thing I really like about this film is it's complete lack of sentimentality or romanticism I think a less interesting film would have been would have romanticized the dead wife as a perfect person and heightened his grieving. But all we really get of her is that she's a drunk and she left him like 700 voicemails that are extremely salacious. Yeah, it's played for humor again. Like it's not played for sentiment at all, but equally so with Ben's admission to Carla towards the end of the film. It's not portrayed as this virtuous once in a lifetime proclamation. It's portrayed with all of the oddity and weirdness and embarrassment of frankly, the reality of the situation. By film's end, it does end on kind of a, a touching moment that I really like, but the future of that proclamation feels very unsolved. And again, it's yeah. heightened for maximum discomfort, which I really liked. Yeah, I can't wait to talk about the end when we get to discuss that in full because it is quite a big scene where stuff happens. But before we get to that, I want to talk about the editing and camera movement in this mm -hmm. film because I think this plays a lot into the dialogue and some terms used to describe the film as being very awkward and anxious. The camera is constantly handheld, it's shaky, and it's all always very up in somebody's face. Mm -hmm. It really lends itself well to that sense of awkwardness and anxiousness that clearly fit into Ben's character, who is really lost in his life and surrounded by these people who are just relentlessly up in his business. <laughs> 100%. And not just talk about the camera movement, we also have the editing that plays a role into this. It is really choppy, and at times it really lacks this visual consistency. At times I felt like a whole moment in life had been filmed in its entirety, and then they yeah. just went and they chopped it down. <laughs> Yeah, as if it totally. was more a memory, bits and pieces strewn together. While it's jarring, I do think this is another thing that adds to the understanding of Ben's state of mind, which is so unclear and unfocused. I think the film is really interested in those things, and it has this kind of this strange quality. It's almost dreamlike. Whenever Ben runs by his old house, his wife is like smoking on the deck. He has uh, like a what's can only be described as like a drug trip of some sort that's in the middle of the film that he sees a variety of things. But it's really cool how he takes those different filmmaking techniques and integrates it into this film that has a variety of styles going on. I enjoy too how the film portrays a particular Jewish community in New York, like as a subset of a, a greater population of Jews within the country. And just skimming a couple of reviews of Jewish critics that I follow, it seems to strike a chord in its accuracy. That's not for me to say because, you know, I, I'm not involved with this community, but I fully enjoyed being ingrained with these people in this community within the film. And though the film clearly states that the sense of humor in some of these practices, there's a clear, I think, reverence for it as well. It's certainly an appreciation and a love for it. The film has this modern an approach to religion where traditions and rituals are respected and undergone, but also disregarded if they're completely nonsensical to mm. modern societies. So at one point they say they're not supposed to take pictures during dinner and they say, oh, God will forgive us. <laughs> so I, I really enjoyed that. I saw it as kind of like a modern form of uh, Judaism that I really liked seeing on screen. I also really enjoyed that scene where he walks into a Catholic church and begins talking with the priest about all the questions mm. that I love when I'm exploring spirituality, which is like, what if I completely devote myself to good? 
good and devote myself to others, but I believed in the wrong religion the whole time. What do I do with all of this doubt when I have doubt? I thought that was a really good scene. There are a bunch of moments in the film that are filled with a lot of heart. Yeah, I agree. I just think that the film doesn't milk those scenes yes. in a way I really like. I was touched by some scenes in the film, but it doesn't feel like it's overdoing it for a mainstream audience, which I like. Okay, so I really want to talk about the ending. Yes, please. So if you haven't seen the film, I recommend going see it unless you don't mind being spoiled. But we are going to get into the ending now. And I do want to talk about this because it's actually quite a lengthy ending. There's an ending ending, but this dinner sequence is pretty much the end of the it's film. It's like the climax. Yeah, it's yeah. the climax of the film. It's where Ben confesses his love for Carla in front of the entire <laughs> dining room table, including one of the girls he had relations with. But this scene is hilarious, <laughs> cringy. It has everything that we talked about in this film in one moment. Yeah, that's my favorite scene in the movie is that whole dinner scene. It's really a work of art because basically you have these escalating tensions and escalating agendas from these different characters, like his moms are always inserting themselves into his life and trying to get him to date Gabby, who's the rabbi's daughter, and he's bringing Carla his student. So nobody's paying attention to Carla. So he tries to compensate for that by talking about Carla too much. And then the moms try to compensate for that by talking about Gabby too much. And it's so uncomfortable. But what I really liked about it is it reminded me like that final scene in Moonstruck where all the storylines and all yeah. the characters converge at once and finally everything is kind of hashed out. <laughs> like all the storylines and character arcs are converging. I just, I love that. It's such a great scene. I definitely agree. I also really loved how it displayed this cathartic sense of release on the character of Ben yeah. because he has been literally living his life almost in like a daze. And there's parts of this movie where I was really considering whether his previous relationship was even making him happy. Yeah. This experience with Carla, is it love? I don't think we really know for sure. But what we know for certain is that he loves her because she has given him something nobody else has been able to give him. Being able to find somebody who helps you grow as a person. Mm -hmm. I think all great relationships involve like people being able to help the other person grow and become better versions of themselves. Mm -hmm. Whether he's just thinking it's love because of these things or it's actual love, I, I don't know if it actually even matters. I think it's weird that the, the whole film goes in that direction, but also it's kind of endearing. You're left to question like, okay, why doesn't this work? It's a very frantic and anxious film, but as we get to the final scene, which is one shot and it's just this slow zoom out, yeah, um, like a retracting shot, is really the only moment in the whole film that it really slows down. Yeah. And it just lets a scene play out and then shows you the trees and then the film ends. A very purposeful way to use the camera because he's showing you that these people have found their way and they're going to be okay. He's found his voice again. He started singing again. She's had her bat mitzvah. Whatever happens after that, there's clearly some growth going on here. And that's the indications we have for that. So you're ready to go to grades? I am. I'm going to give this a B plus. I thought that this movie was a lot of fun and it was really funny. It actually reminded me a lot of the indie boom in like the, the mid 2000s. Yeah. Some of the early Michael Sarah films like Juno and, and Paper Heart and when the Duplass brothers were making films together, like those sort of of grainy, super underground, just cute indie comedies. It reminded me a lot of that, but you just add a lot of cringe. I don't want to discount Nathan Silver's voice here. I haven't seen his other films, but this one does feel unique in a way. Because yeah. as I said at the you know the top of the review, you have some idea, some idea of like a Sundance movie that this would be where these two people, they make each other feel good and then it kind of ends. And that's not what this movie is. This movie is really interested in complicating and cringing every little bit out of all of these embarrassing moments. And I could think like objectively, it's maybe like a hair too long or you could have cut this scene or that scene, but I really enjoyed myself the whole time. I got in check my watch a single time. Yeah, I completely agree with just how unique this film was. It, it, it's a film like you don't see every day. It's not made for mainstream audiences in a way. And I think that's what makes it better. Also, another great example of what you could do on a low budget. Mm -hmm. I really loved how, how natural the film felt. It didn't feel like it was being crafted in a certain way and that kind of goes to a little bit what I'm going to say in the ending. However, I give this film an A minus. I really loved it as oh, wow. much as you That's did great. as well. I think the film does come across as very chaotic and strange at times, but ultimately I think maybe it's more realistic to the human experience because of it. Sometimes when watching a film, you really feel the design. You feel the cogs and the wheels meant to drive your emotions. But here it's like Nathan Silver purposely mm. puts you in a car with uneven tires and a gas gauge that does not work. And thus you're left with a sense of disorientation and anxiousness while heading to your ultimate destination. And and it's in this journey that you realize how touching the film is and how it's more honest 
and authentic to the human experience, an experience of loss and chaos, ultimately resulting in a catharsis where the camera finally takes a step back and a sense of stillness and peace fills the frame. Yeah, I think that's perfectly said. So that's it for our review of Between the Temples, which is now playing in cinema. So definitely check it out. Have you seen the film? Let us know what you think below and we will see you next time.